Dear authors and distinguished speakers, Johannes Bär, Ingo Köhler, Ruth Dittelmann, Alexander Busold, dear members of the Hertie School and of the Hertie Foundation, dear Dr. Schneider of the Society for Business History, ladies and gentlemen. As president of the Hertie School, it is my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for an incredibly important event on the history of the Hertie Department Store Group, whose name we still carry in the foundation and in our school. Many of you have waited with much anticipation for the study we are finally about to present to you in English today. Persecuted, Aaronized, Compensated. How the Hermann Tietz Department Store Group became Hattie. Behind Compensated was a question mark if you didn't hear it. Before I begin, I would like to extend a special welcome to the people who are not in the room. The members of the Tietz family, or today the Tietz and Jason family. We are delighted that you have joined us online and are grateful for the continued exchange with you in recent months. And please allow me to also greet the entire Gesellschaft für Unternehmensgeschichte, Society of Business History, with its director, Andrea Schneider, here today, who has led the project that uh, produced the study we are about to talk about tonight. The publication of this study is a major stepping stone in coming to terms with Hattie's history. It provides the first in-depth look at the Aaronization process that robbed the Tietz family of their business, drawing on a wide range of previously inaccessible documents. Amongst other achievements, this book corrects the historical record. For many years, it was claimed that the Tietz family lost their department stores due to the economic difficulties within the company brought on by the depression of the late 1920s and that the family was adequately compensated. This book makes it unavocably clear that these statements are not true. The seizure of the Tietz department store was a part of the systemic, systematic prosecution and robbery of Jewish entrepreneurs that occurred during the Nazi regime. The book also goes into painstaking detail about the assets held and shows that the valuation of these assets was in itself a deeply political and biased process, but I will let the authors tell you about this in detail. The study is the result of a long process that started in 2018 when a group of Hertie student and alumni called for a more thorough and open investigation of the history of Hertie during the Nazi years. The Hatiz Initiative's activism led the Hattie Foundation to commission this independent study of the aaronization of the Tietz family's department stores that took place in 1933 and the reparation process that took place after the war. I would like to thank everybody involved in making this process move forward and have us the, give us the opportunity to talk about this history today quite, quite warmly because it was not an easy process. Our event today will begin with a presentation of the study's finding from its authors, Professor Johannes Baer and Professor Ingo Köhler. Johannes Baer is an associate professor of economic and social history at Goethe University in Frankfurt, and Ingo Köhler is the managing director of the Hessian Economic Archive in Darmstadt, in Darmstadt as well as the adjunct professor of economic, economic and social history at the University of Göttingen. Prior to the study, both have researched and published extensively on the topic of Aaronization and German economic and company history in the early 20th century. And let me just share with you what I learned uh, in the course of this, um, this process. There is always a quotation mark with Aaronization, not because it is in question that it happened, but because the word Aaronization comes out of Nazi imaginary where there is an Aryan race and talking about the process does not mean that we accept that imaginary, which is why the quotation marks are always necessary. Following this presentation about the, from the authors, we will hear from our panel, where Professor Ruth Dittelmann and Alexander Busold will join Johannes Baer and Ingo Köhler. Professor Ruth Dittelmann is Professor of Psychology and Public Policy at the Hertie School. Her research focuses on intergroup relations, the potential and limits of interventions to promote social cohesion and build peace, and the psychology of national identity. Not only does this make her an expert on the mechanisms of bias and discrimination, but also on the importance of collective memory and how to achieve it. 
A study she published in 2023 shows, for example, the impact of stumbling stones, Stolpersteine, and the impact they can have on substantially, substantially decreasing local far-right vote shares. Alexander Busold is, Hert is a Hertie alumnus, class of 2019? 16. 16. <laughs> and I knew I should check with you before I wrote this down. <laughs> and founder of the Hertie's Initiative, as well as the 2021 winner of the Hertie Alumni Achievement Award for his work with the initiative. Even though the Hertie's Initiative is re represented by Alexander Busold today, please allow me to read out the names of all current team members so that you know who they are because many of them are in the room tonight. So you can stand up and be recognized. I'll read out the names. Laura Franken, Anna Ahrens, David Imhoff, Lars Mewald, Sarah De Lehre, Janina Lehmann, Johannes Brack, Max Thiri, Torben Klauser, and Paul Denfeld. Don't be shy. Stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you again for your contribution to tonight's event. And with this, I will hand over the stage to Johannes Beer and Ingo Köhler to present their findings. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks for the welcome and uh, to all for coming. It's really great that we can present the book uh, at Hattie School this evening, this Friday evening. As you probably know, um, we owe the book to Hattie School yeah, as a birthplace and the center of the Hattie's initiative. Um, well, it's hard to present a book with more than 400 pages and a full new, uh, uh, new findings um, in about 20 minutes. I hope we get it in 20 minutes. I promise we will not repeat uh, the summary which you have, um, just uh, highlight some points and uh, we hope to deepen it in the discussion. At the first part, I would like to present our findings on the so-called ionization, you know, it's a quotation marks, it's not usual in English, but in German, uh, ionization of the Hermann Tietz uh, group. Afterwards, um, Ingo will present the second part, uh, which is on the post-war period and the restitution. Let me start with some remarks on Hermann Tietz and Hattie. Hattie of obviously a name uh, made from creations of Hermann Tietz. And to this first point, uh, your uh, slide, uh, it's important to remember that Hermann Tietz has been the second largest department store group in Europe at this time, uh, with major department stores in like the famous KDV in, in Berlin, and large real estate assets. Uh, it was one of the greatest success stories of the German retail trade and one of the most popular shopping addresses in Germany at this time. The group was fully owned by the Tietz uh, family, the descendants of the company founder, Oskar Tietz. After the... It's okay. <laughs> okay. After the National Socialist seizure of power, the family came under pressure because of their Jewish faith and was forced to hand over the group to Hertie. Hertie has been founded by a banking consortium in 1933 exclusively for this purpose. Um, with Georg Kark, uh, employee of the Hermann Tietz uh, Group as uh, general manager, managing director, and um, a few years later, Kark had the opportunity to take over the group. Hattie uh, remained in the hands of the Kark family until 1993, when it passed over to Karstadt, uh, which has now become a uh, Galleria. Uh, Maybe this will change in the next time. Um, well, what does the Hattie Stiftung have to do with this? The Stiftung was founded by the Kark family 
According uh, to its mission statement, it is based on the life's work of Georg Karg. And this life work began in 1933. And it based on the fact that the members of the Tietz family lost their life's work. My second point is um, that the injustice was always concealed at Herti. The tradition of Hermann Dietz was invoked, but there was also no sense of injustice, and had his history was told in a version after which the group was willingly handed over to the banks for restructuring because of the debts of the uh, companies. According to this narrative, the Dietz family would have treated fairly and willingly emigrate uh, with a high compensation of about 12 million Reismark. Our research in 70 archives, including the archives of the Jason and Tietz families in New York, shows that these narratives are legends. Uh, the truth is that the Tietz family lost the Hermann Dietz group only because they were Jewish, not because of the debts. And the truth is also that the family was blackmailed by Hitler's regime and the banks, which refused them loans. Allegedly, the owners were locked in a hotel room and they agreed until they agreed to the alienation. For the family, this meant an enormous loss without any compensation in 1934. Third point. A core of uh, the story of our book is a persecution and robbery of Jewish department store entrepreneurs during the Third Reich. Due to the high proportion of Jewish entrepreneurs in this sector, uh, the anti-Semitic agitation was directed against department stores more than against any other sectors of the German uh, business. After Hitler ceased to power, the department stories were openly terrorized with boycotts and violence. Hermann Tietz was brought on the brink of insolvency. The banks refused to lend them, and the general public booked on it indifferently, as you can see in these pictures. However, the owners of the group from the Tietz family, Georg Tietz, Martin Tietz, and her brother-in-law, Hugo Zwillenberg, they could not be dismissed as managers of a stock corporation. Hermann Tietz had the legal form, and it's very important, of a general partnership, and its owners were personally liable partners. It's a little bit complicated, special construction that German uh, civil law. Uh, they were legally liable for the group's debts, and the banks and the government didn't want to release them from these liabilities. The solution, the banks came up, was to build, uh, to, to establish a takeover company with the name Hattie. So Hattie was uh, in, in, uh, founded in uh, July 1933. At the first step, the Tietz family was forced to hand over central, uh, the central control of the group to Hattie, the Geschäftsführung. For this, Hattie became one of the partners instead of Hugo Zwillenberg. You see the change uh, caused by this uh, contract. Only after this contract was signed, the group was rescued with a loan of around 40 million Reichsmark the year. 1933 is missing on the, on the slide. Uh, okay, please add it. Um, next uh, step, second step, um, uh, was that the debts of the group and the assets of the Dietz family were calculated. In long negotiations, the family had to agree to a so-called deed of partition, another sehr, very special expression in German Auseinandersetzungsvertrag. By this contract, uh, the Tietz family lost almost one 
near uh, their all uh, company assets. It's very difficult to value the assets uh, because this was not a sale, but uh, a, a kind of uh, accounting of claims. However, there's a strong evidence uh, that the group amounts about uh, 150 million. It's, it's, uh, uh, this black bear, and uh, you see uh, the red bar um, where with uh, losses due to arbitrary calculations, which are unjustified calculations. The family didn't receive any compensation, only some concessions worth around two and a half million RS mark, including a small business in Berlin and a license uh, for uh, foreign trade transactions. My fourth and last point, what are the findings on Georg Karg, who is seen as the founder of the Hertie Stiftung? Karg was not a member of the National Socialist Party, nor did he hate the Jews, but he willingly profited from the National Socialist interests. He did not take over the company directly from the Tietz family, that was the banks, but he profited more from this alienation than anyone else. This injustice advanced his career, and three years later, he was able to take over Hattie from the banks on very favorable terms, uh, kind of giveaway prices. Uh, along uh, the way, he privately took over a number of smaller Jewish-owned stories. In short, he was not a Nazi, but a profiteer without scruples, and one of the many skilled entrepreneurs the Nazis needed. Um, that's the end of the first part, and I uh, pass the floor to Ingo. So, thank you and hello, everybody. Um, Johannes presented us the first part of um, the story. Uh, it's a story about the, the private takeover uh, of the company, and I will gladly hook up on that at that point. But let me just note one point. Uh, from the outset of the project, our aim was always not only to examine uh, the Iranization case of 1933-1934, but to embed it into a broader historical context, focusing on the face of the family, the Tietz family, and the Tietz company. And I would like to briefly introduce two topics on that. The first one is emigration and expropriation by the Nazi regime. Because even after the loss of their family business, the Tietz Wurmbeck family suffered discrimination, persecution, and robbery. Uh, foremost state-led robbery. In 1934, the families initially decided to remain in Germany. They hoped to escape the public eye and avoid further hostilities. However, these aspirations were not fulfilled. When the Nazi regime stepped up its anti-Jewish persecution measures, including targeting their children at school and so on, George and Martin Tietz considered emigrating. In 1937, they successfully purchased a so-called financial citizenship in the Principality of Luxembourg. They intended, sorry, Liechtenstein. Uh, Liechtenstein. Sorry, yeah. They intended to use their status as foreigners to protect themselves, their families, and their assets from being attacked by the regime. George and Edith Tietz managed to emigrate to the USA with their children via England and Cuba. Martin and Annie Tietz stayed in Cuba, and Betty Tietz followed her sons in 1938 and emigrated also into the United States. She was a US citizen by birth. For the Zwillenbeck family, fleeing Nazi Germany turned out to be much more difficult. Hugo Zwillenberg retired to his country estate in West Haveland. He kept a 
business office, a small business office here in Berlin from where he coordinated various investments. But in the course of the November pogrom in 1938, however, he was arrested and taken to Sachsenhausen concentration camp. Zwillenberg was only released after he had sold his property under duress. The family fled to the Netherlands, where they were arrested again in 1943, and only escaped the Nazi murder machine because they received a Nicaraguan diplomatic passport. In the context of emigration, so now we come to the state expropriation, because it heralded the next stage in economic persecution measures. The Nazi state now enriched itself through the Reich's flight tax and anti-Jewish compulsory Levi's on the properties of the Tietz family. A large part of their domestic assets, estimated at 5.2 million Reichsmark in 1933, were confiscated by the German tax authorities. In addition, the families had to sell their representative homes. You can see one here on the slide at the Kaiserallee 184 in Wilmersdorf, at the Hohenzollern Damm in Dahlem, or the Königsallee in Grunewald, were far below value. These proceeds were sized again for the confiscatory anti-Jewish taxes. A veritable enriched competition arose over the uh, art and book collections that the brothers Tietz and Hugo Zwillenberg had accumulated over the years and had to leave behind. The collections were confiscated in 1942 as assets hostile to the Reich. Expert tried to keep the best prizes for the, uh, the best pieces for their museums until the tax authorities sold off most of the art objects at auctions. This was not only a loss for the family, but also for German culture as a whole. Now let us turn to my second important topic, changing focus to post-war history. I call it the second encounter after World War II, the history of the restitution and compensation provisions after the war. As in a court case, the delict itself and the attempts to come into terms with the legally are closely linked, and we ourselves ask how the profiteers and the persecuted behaved when they met again after 1945 uh, and faced each other now in different roles as climans and obligies. How did they behave under the heavy burdens of the Nazi past? Here we have to differentiate two categories of the legal processing. On the one hand, state composition, uh, compensation provisions, the so-called Entschädigung, this involved financial compensation for a tax on life, limb, and freedom, as well as so-called damages to assets. This means the state expropriation through discriminatory taxes and squandering of private treasures. The Tietz family's experience in uh, pursuing their claims were very bad. German authorities tried to delay the proceedings and degraded the family to being petitioners. It took 20 years before the financial claims were approved, although all the experiences of discriminations, robbery, and violence can never be outweighed by money. The second category, the restitution, brought together Georg Karg and the Tietz family, because it's a private restitution of so-called identifiable assets. This legal concept was also implemented by the uh, allied authorities. Their aim was to return companies or real estate that had illegally come into the position of German buyers back into the hand of the true owners. The interventions of the Nazi era should be returned in REM to the status quo of 1933 or financially uh, compensated. All transactions and contracts were with persecuted persons. This is a, a restitution law. Uh, 
all the transactions and contracts with persecuted persons between 1933 and 1945 were in principle placed under the suspicious, a suspicion of illegal takeover. And at the same time, the property of all German companies had been under allied control since the end of the war. Entrepreneurs were only allowed to uh, operate freely again once the restitution issues had been clarified. This principle also forced Georg Karg and Hertie to the negotiation table with the former owners. And the Hertie situation uh, in 1945 was a crisis. Many branches of the Hertie uh, Warenhaus, the uh, department store in the, uh, where, um, uh, where in the east, which now were located in the Soviet zone and then lost. The four large department stores in the western parts of Germany, in Hamburg, Munich, Stuttgart and Karlsruhe, had been partially damaged. Nevertheless, Georg Tietz planned to rebuild the company. He quickly entered into restitution proceedings so as not to hinder the reconstruction of the company any longer. The family claims amount to the payment of 25 million Deutschmarks and the restitution of the department store's properties. To keep a long story short, the Tietz family's property in Western Germany was restituted. But the agreement between the two parties has a special character. Georg Tietz and the Tietz family entered, uh, Georg Karg and the Tietz family entered into a kind of new business relationship based on a restitution settlement in 1949. The families regained ownership of the three department stores' properties in southern Germany, but immediately leased them back to the Hertie Group for 20 years until 1971. A revenue share of up to 2.5% uh, from the sales of these stores was set as a rent. In this way, a one-off payment was thus converted into a moderate quarterly repayment. This gave the troubled happy uh, group the opportunity to cover its restitution obligations from the profits generated. In retrospect, this agreement bore more success than originally thought. In 1949, the three department stores were expected to have a future average annual turnover of around 50 million Deutschmark, which would have resulted in a total compensation of around 30 million Deutschmark over the years. However, the Hattie department stores were much more successful due to the economic boom years in the 50s and 60s. In 1961 alone, for example, they achieved sales of around uh, 200 million Deutschmark, meaning that the payments to the family were also significantly higher than originally expected. But even if there was financial compensation, Georg Haag and Hertie never took moral responsibility for their own past and its involvement with the Nazi regime. Throughout his life, Karg denied any complicity uh, and uh, the ironization itself. He delegated responsibility for the injustice solely to the Nazi state. Following a familiar pattern of argumentation used by German entrepreneurs after the World War II, he still saw himself as only as a reorganizer of a struggling, uh, struggling hearty company and not as a profiteer of the anti-Jewish persecution measures. In the negotiation with the Tietz family, there was apparently an, information, an informal agreement not to openly address the issue of moral guilt. This seems to be the only way to reach a restitution arrangement. The talks took place in a pragmatic, business-like manner, which surprises to today's observers and us reading the sources. However, it should also be noted that the successors of Herti, the Kaksche Familienstiftung, later the Herti Foundation, seem to have forgotten their historical responsibility towards the victim, uh, victims of Aryanization for too long, too. 
We hope that our book will fundamentally change this and that the Tietz family will be shown the respect it deserves for its achievements in establishing one of the most prominent German department store companies and their experience of persecution and discrimination they suffered. So, thank you. Thank you very much for this perfectly timed presentation. Can I ask Ruth Dittelmann and Alexander Busol to join us on stage as well? So that we can start a panel discussion and then open it up to the audience for the remaining 30 minutes. And maybe since you've just um, told us the story, I will turn to my left first and then uh, get back to you. And I will start on the very left with Alexander Busold and uh, ask you to tell us about the Hertitz Initiative. When, when did you become interested in this history and what did it take to get to sitting up here today? Can you hear me well? Now I think, perfect, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, first of all. It's really um, great that we have this book presentation and the discussion here and also later all of your questions. So I think it's a super important event. Um, thank you very much for, for having us here. Um, first of all, Hatiz Initiative is really a group of students and alumni mainly of the Hati School. We are a core group of maybe around 10 people and a group of um, more than 200 supporters um, that follow our newsletter and have signed petitions and letters. And um, I... I started looking into the topic, um, I think, in 2017 when I did a fellowship with the NGO Humanity in Action and, and really then um, stumbled across the topic, um, as, as many others at the Hattie School did, when a student wrote an article in the student paper governance post, so like just an article. And, um, and, and many, many of us, including me, asked ourselves, um, well, why, why do we learn about this history only by coincidence um, through like a, a, a more kind of... Um, yeah, just because the student uh, thought about writing an article in the student magazine or newspaper about it. So I think really this, this irritation about the screaming silence around this topic that we, um, about institu institution, we cared so much about um, being part of the Hurdy School and also strongly identifying with it. That was really the starting point to ask, well, why, why are we so silent about this topic? I mean, it's in our name. I mean, Hattie comes from Hermann Tietz. There's this financial continuity. I mean, yes, Hattie School was only founded uh, 20 years ago, as we can see, and, and Hurdy Foundation in 1974. But nevertheless, the money which funds, um, or at least partially funds, um, all of the students that study here, the salaries of the people working here, um, there is this continuity. So there's this origin kind of story. And without the crimes to the to the Dietz family, we also heard about today, we we wouldn't be here. So so I think that was really this this starting point, and also this belief in the Hurdy School community idea of um, being based on an open democracy and also science and facts, and just thinking, well, we also need to do something about being truthful about our own history and looking into this and have more transparency um, regarding this. So, so this really was the starting point, and then. Um, over two years, and um, we we had a, we were a group of students and alumni. We started looking into the topic, talking to the Hurdy School, the Hurdy Foundation, um, having many meetings and emails and um, and letters, and um, also like some some letters with with more than or like with around 150 signatories. And there was some progress over the in these two years. We had an information board um, installed in the cafeteria, uh, which you can still see today. Um, also, Hendrik Endelein really fought for this one. And also, there was um, I think like a first step where the Hurdy Foundation. I think first time in its history acknowledged that there was an organization going on, which was already like some, some progress. Um, we as the Hatiz Initiative were really not content with that, I think mainly because we had the impression that there was still this dominating narrative, that it was the um, Tietz family were more or less mainly just needing to sell the company because of bad business acumen, because of bad skills. And, and already there was some research existing by um, like some chapters of her um, PhD dissertation by, um, by a political scientist, Simone Ladwig Winters, and there you could already see with many sources that this main narrative was highly problematic, that um, there was like a lot of evidence that this wasn't true, that they just needed to sell it because they were kind of bad business persons. So we really um, kept pushing and said, well, um, we, we need more, we need more transparency, more knowledge, and we need more awareness about this and really a change in the narrative. And um, also the work like in the process, a lot of, um, I would say, kind of broken promises towards our initiative, which at some point we decided to um, then go to the press and go public. And this, I think, really 
was surprising because then it was the whole really nation discussing this. There were so many articles on it, which was also very much surprising for us as, as kind of a student and alumni um, initiative. And, and But it was really also, I think, a very exciting, good thing to really have so many people then starting to discuss about it. So I think for us, having the goal of an increased awareness of this topic, this was really also something important to really kind of kickstart the discussion on this. Um, a day later, after the first article, the, the Hurley Foundation then also promised to commission um, kind of this um, publicly promised to commission um, a study, which um, which we now uh, really see here, and that maybe was was kind of the the starting point um, of maybe like in, in a summary. Um, I think what really was important for us as Hurley uh, Hertie's initiative was also this belief that actually addressing this topic would be good for our community, so identifying with the Hurley community, and we we believe that because I think what you discuss and what you address really shows what you care about, what you identify with. It's a question of power and belonging, what you address and what you talk about, what you give space, and what you, give, what you don't give space. So I think, and I, I will end with, with one anecdote, which is that we also, during our engagement, came across um, um, a person who, um, who was a Jewish student in Berlin, and, um, and he actually wanted to apply for the Hurdy School, but then he came across that kind of this history was not addressed yet. And being a Jewish student, he then really didn't feel safe being part of a community that does not address this specific kind of history. And I think this just shows how, how really commemoration culture has an effect on how we as a community define ourselves today and how inclusive we are. Thank you very much. And, and I would like to continue in a later question um, some of the expectations you just voiced here. But let me turn to Ruth Dittelmann and ask uh, exactly about the last point you mentioned about identifying with something and the role this has for identity and belonging. Ruth, um, as, a, um, as a social psychologist, can you tell us what the difference is between telling a story, having a history, and then moving into something that is actually collective memory and that is a lived memory that is shared. Yeah, um, yeah this is working well. I mean, first of all, I, I would really um, like to um, thank um, the authors for this book and also acknowledge all the efforts and the activism of the Hatids Initiative because I really think this is a milestone in the history of the Herty School that we have this book. And I also find the book very um, diligently researched and, and very readable, even though I'm neither a historian nor an economist. So I definitely recommend it to those of you who haven't read it, especially when it will be available in English. Um, yeah, so now that we have this book, um, how do we make sure that we don't, you know, that it doesn't, that, that the story in the book isn't forgotten again, you know, as if, amongst our community and also as new generations of students come in? And how do we make sure? Um, that we that we um, remember this this history that we continue to remember it and I, and I will say that there there is a risk um, and um, this is not just the risk that any book faces I think of falling off the radar but um, we have this unfortunate tendency that when we're confronted with information about historical injustice that we tend to evade this information or reconstruct it or forget it and this is even true. Um, for people who don't have any direct implication in the history because they were born much later, for example, but just if only if we sense that there are groups that are important to us were involved as perpetrators that can already have this effect on us. And there's quite a lot of empirical research demonstrating this, including some of my own work, where we, for example, see that when we give people information about historical injustice, um, compared to other similarly complex information about other topics, the memory performance is impaired. So people literally like, remember less of the facts in, in those texts. And so given that, um, how can we you know, move forward? And I think here it's where the concept of collective memory is really important. So we want this history to become part of our collective memory at the Hertie School. And collective memory, it's the social representation of history. And importantly, that is linked, and I think this is what Alexander already hinted at, to the identity of that community. 
And I, as a psychologist, I, I believe that collective memory is both in the minds of people and their social relationships, and also in formal and informal artifacts in the world. And so this book here is an, a formal artifact, and it's a really important one, and I think it will be a big part of our you know, um, remembrance efforts moving forward. And then we can also think about more informal artifacts and symbols. And this is really a creative process. So these can be, you know, things from, you know, ranging from memorials, um, uh, artistic responses maybe to the book. Um, we can, you know, think about educational formats or targeted stipends. And for an example from the urban landscape is the Stolpersteine Memorial that Cornelia already mentioned um, that uh, some of my research is focused on. But I also looked up some examples from what other universities are doing, um, the few that are doing something. And, and so one example comes from Brown University, so that's a, a different, a very different context, also a different history. But they um, published in 2014 a report of the historical facts of their um, ties with the transatlantic slave trade and the ways that the university benefited from it. And then one of the things they did afterwards is that they commissioned a sculpture, and it's a sculpture of an iron ball and a broken chain. And they very deliberately placed the sculpture at a central location so that new visitors and new students couldn't miss it. And the sculpture is set up in a way that encourages um, fresh discovery and, and reflection every time. And so, of course, we will have to find our own formats here, and they have to reflect who we are as a community. But I think this can maybe be some sort of inspiration. And I think that the point is the reason why these activities will be important, because they will allow us to integrate this history in our collective memory, and that can then prevent us from collectively forgetting this history again. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Let me turn to Ingo Köhler and get back to the um, part you highlighted, and that is the business relationship that the uh, Kark and Tietz families developed um, after the war. In, in a way, you mentioned that this is a rather unusual setup, and I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on this encounter story and what we can learn more generally for relations between victims and perpetrators. Yeah, um, it was... When we looked this, uh, looked up this case, we found really this unusual setup you mentioned. Uh, unusual in this way that um, when we follow all the historical research and and compare them with with other organization cases, we don't find any case where there's such a new business. A corporation found in 1949, and and there's a simple reason because most of the most of the uh, persecuted um, did not return into the companies after 1945, because and the simple reason is they they could not even imagine returning to Germany uh, in the country of the perpetrators. So that that was one one point, and then. Um, there was another point, and, and another point is most of the um, uh, most of the persecuted had not been able to build up a new base of living in emigration. So mostly, they suffered an, uh, a lot and enormous loss of status, and, and even became impoverished. So they were often uh, already open for a quick settlement and for quick deals to, to get the money back. And there are so much wounds um, between, in these proceedings. So we had these proceedings, these legal uh, arrangement brought in into the German uh, legal uh, system by the uh, Allied, but there are so much wounds again made by these uh, how the uh, German uh, authorities behave in the uh, in the Entschädigungscases, in the compensation cases, and so on. So we wonder why uh, did the Tietz family and the, uh, act different? And I think we have two or three ideas about that. The first idea was there was a kind of personal connection between uh, Georg Karg and the family. Um, they met already before 1933. 
because Georg Karg uh, was a sales manager in, in the company. So that was point one. Maybe it made it easier to find a kind of new uh, arrangement um, um, after uh, 1945. The next one is um, the Tietz family was aware that Hertie was not in a position for a, a, a one hand of payment in this great dimension. And if they had insisted on that one uh, one of compensation that would uh, have meant the end of the Hertie and the loss of their family's entrepreneurial legacy. Uh, so Hermann Tietz would end with Hertie. And, and so you can see there's, there's a, a, a big emotional bind uh, between the family and the company even after 1945. So, so that may be one of these special uh, arrangement, or oh, this, this um, a good, one of the reasons for this uh, arrangement in 1949. Um, and, and maybe another reason is um, that the Tietz family were successful again uh, in the emigration because they quite early emigrated in the, in the States and they had the opportunity uh, to obtain professional legal advice in the rest restitution cases also because uh, they were not impoverished. So, uh, to put it briefly, the, the Tietz family was particularly resilient uh, against these new, um, yeah, these new processings after 1945. Can I ask something? Yes, please. So just a clarifying question, because one part that um, I didn't quite also understand in the book is that it seems like initially there was a very sort of aggressive tone coming from the representatives of CAG, mm -hmm. but then, and I understood it almost like, you know, behind the scenes, there was a more cooperative um, encounter between CAG and the Tietz family, and I was always wondering how to understand that, and if that was already one of the first, you know, signs of Kak's opportunism that he was sort of putting on, you know, two different fronts, or mm. how, or how, how was that not, not the right way to understand that? I just wasn't quite sure how no, to make I don't, sense of it. I don't think so. Yeah. That's a really good question. But 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 what we found is uh, there are two levels. There's a personal level bet between Georg Kak and uh, and uh, with the, in the face to face contact with the family. So and and here uh, Georg Kak tries to moderate and tries. Uh, he, he did not really say, okay, uh, I have a moral guilt, but he says, okay, we can cooperate, we can um, build up a new future. And then we have this second level, and the second, second level uh, is the attorney level, um, where from the beginning there were really hard discussions on that level. And, and when there are big conflicts, there again the, the, the level of moderation between Georg Karg and the person and, and the family face to face come into play to, to, to find new ways in that. So uh, there the, the two levels go parallel in, in, in all these uh, negotiations uh, between 19. 48 and, and 49, and we find it again that there were conflicts between, um, between uh, Georg Karg and Hertie and the family, even after in the, in the 60s and the, at the end of the 50s, because um, even more Hertie becomes successful as a department store and earned much more money. Uh, f for them, uh, the restitution seemed, seemed as a burden uh, for uh, for uh, yeah uh, wachstum uh, for yeah for further growth, so they tried to uh, put it aside all this restitution, and then again they come come up these personal trying uh, personal contact between Kark and the family, trying to moderate it. Um, so that's really really interesting uh, how these. Uh, levels interplay in all these uh, restitution uh, negotiations. Thank you. Um, 
Johannes, you have researched on other organizations, other companies, and the way they have tried to face their, um, their past, in particular during the National Socialist period. Can you tell us what obstacles keep organizations from engaging with the difficult part of their history, or what facilitates it? Well, they are quite uh, different uh, experiences, as, as different as the companies and the groups are. Uh, so, most of them, um, well, well, many say we have a jubilee, yes, and we have we need such a book uh, like this one, and afterwards uh, the chapter is closed. Uh, other one, uh, very busy and, and very engaged in the past. And um, they are now active. They have uh, lessons. They uh, looked for other books, and uh, uh, we are uh, continually in a communication on this topic. And um, so there are different ways to uh, to to learn from uh, this uh, history. Uh, but only another point is uh, this remembrance. Uh, Culture, yes, which is uh, different from history, as you uh, already told, uh, and um, so we are uh, maybe we are kind of advisor for this remembrance culture. <laughs> but before you start with a remembrance culture, you need to have the facts and the historical, uh, and it's a, a book on history. Yes, yeah, so, you know, remembrance culture is a construction of the. Uh, of the present, yeah, aligned to to our today's values, and um, that's not a uh, history. It's not a uh, work for historians. But but sorry, we we always have, but also we have always in mind uh, writing of all these facts. Uh, how can we put it in practice? So, so what you mentioned is, is so important to us. How can we communicate um, not only with books, but with objects or uh, like you mentioned, uh, Stolpersteine and so on. Uh, and I think that is really um, the most important thing to, to, to get into the transfer of the historical exploration into historical communication. Um, so, yeah. So that uh, gives me the opportunity, before opening it up in, in about five minutes, to ask us all, and I'll ask a different version of this, where do we go from here? Let me t turn to Alexander first. What are the expectations from you on I'll say me on us as the Hattie School, but more generally, what to do with this, um, these findings we have now. So activists often have the reputation to never be content and always want more. And I guess we're part of the activists who deserve this reputation. Uh, so for us, really, I think it would be um, the idea that this, this event here is more the beginning, not the end, of really engaging with this history. So now seeing this book as kind of the, the, the knowledge base on which we now can start to engage with this history and really start to to then discuss, well, what does that actually mean? I mean, what can how can a commemoration culture for us as an institution, um, but also for the Hurdy community at large, um, how can this look like? Um, how can we really fill this with life? How can we make this participatory to also invite students or other Hurdy fellows to really start their own initiatives and to really encourage this and maybe have a have a culture where this is not something strange, but more really encouraged. And um, so, so questions really about this this open and also sustainable commemoration culture. So as, as you said, um, Ruth, to really not kind of take the book and just put it in the library and kind of uh, dust make put dust on it, but really to to make something out of this. And I there think are with no this, dust on our books ever. <laughs> of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I think that's really this this basic idea and. I mean, there, I'm, I'm sure there would be hundreds of ideas already in the room if we started a workshop here. I mean, some, some ideas how this could look like could be to really start a chair, to have a new chair in this, um, to research maybe marginalization or right-wing extremism, or there could be so many really linked topics. Um, it could be really an idea to look at all the existing curriculum and see where can this history be really intertwined and intertangled in the curriculum? Where can it say, serve as a case study? Where can we really make kind of links from the past to current debates? we have in the society. So I think that really could be um, another route to take. 
Um, one more is really to also increase accessibility of the knowledge that we have. So um, yeah, earlier today we also discussed um, that there might be an English translation um, coming um, or it could be an idea to really see if maybe the English translation at some point could also be open access to really, um, so that people don't need to buy the book to really gain access to the knowledge um, or it could be to um, yeah, make make sources available. I don't know that for, for uh, scientists is always a huge thing, but uh, of course uh, those are um, also um, wishes. Um, I think, yeah, there, I could, I could go on. I mean, we also, um, the Hurley Foundation announced that there is a fund to fight anti-Semitism, so I think there could also be some potential to invite students to apply and do their own projects to really make the kind of, what are the governance criteria of this fund, what are the selection criteria, what's the impact concept of that to really start also the process there. Um, so these are all ideas, and, and I think, where really this this book and this um, this really very interesting case study can also serve as as a kind of reminder that there are always kind of options to act in the here and now. So what, for example, when I was reading it, I was thinking about um, alternatives that Georg Haag could have considered. And of course, it's easy to say this, being born generations later, and uh, I don't know if I would have acted differently, but but just to think about, well, Georg Haag, of course, he could have. Um, he could have thought about how to support the Tietz family best to actually make it out of the country with as much fortune or with their lives intact. Um, he could have, maybe after becoming managing director, I think it was within eight days in the book you said that he, I think he led off almost like much more than 200 Jewish employees. And I think this was without being forced to do so. So he really played along with this kind of racist ideology of the Nazis, of this anti-Semitism, it seems at some parts in the book quite easily. So he, he could have resisted without personal risk to maybe not let them off at that point in time. We don't know, right? It's always easy to speculate. So but I there think were the banks that, that was the problem. They, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, or maybe after the war. I mean, when, when reading the book, um, it almost seems unimaginable that Georg Karg would have had by himself the idea to at least give back parts of the company to the Tietz family. And, but really, he really only turned his behavior when there was pressure by, um, by kind of the, the legal system that, that not giving back anything was not an option. So then he started to be more reconciliant and, and really engage in the discussion. So I think, and, and those options, I mean, it might not stay so theoretical. I mean, we, um, we are again in a time where there's um, kind of many Jews, also Berlin, don't feel safe. In the last um, year we had kind of David stars on some, some apartments of Jews in, in Berlin, and this kind of felt like a target, like marking them. Um, we have anti-Muslim racism rising again. We have so many kind of challenges in the here and now that really, like we, we all know the upcoming election in Turing where the AfD um, has kind of, is the largest party and um, they might bec become part of the government um, if we are not really careful. So I think these, these questions, they might not, might not stay so theoretical how we would have acted. And I think this really can serve also as a motivation for the Hurdy School. Um, of course, I mean, the science and research, it needs to be neutral and rigorous methods, but of course, regarding the questions, what we research and what we engage in, I think it needs to be very clear that it's also public policy school, and it is clear, and which is based on an open democracy and really, um, yeah, the truth and facts matter. So I think um, that should really should, should, should be somehow, I think, connected to um, being rooted in this past. Thank you. And I'm not surprised you came with the list. I, I take the points uh, with me. Um, but you said something important, and that is the move from the analysis to something that is more normative. And I'd like to ask Ruth, what are or what can be the normative goals of a collective remembrance effort? I'll try to be brief, though, because I also want to make sure we have enough time, right? Um, so I, th I, I will just, I mean, I, I think maybe I will say two things. One, um, I, I, I very much like everything you said, so I'm in agreement, but that's also boring. But I will say that maybe <laughs> um, what is helpful for me is to consider that uh, remembrance activities have, you know, normally sort of backward-looking and forward-looking goals or can have, and that both of these are important. And I think this is also linked to what Johannes said, that often remembrance culture is also about the present more than it is about, about the past. And I think that's the more forward-looking part of it. The more backward-looking part to me is about symbolic truth and justice, and that really 
is about commemorating the, the victims and um, the crimes that were committed against them, as well as the accomplishments and the merits that, I mean, because part of the injustice is often downplaying those. And then I think the one, the part that is more, you know, focused towards the present or the future is, I think, the normatively more complicated one where it becomes fuzzier and potentially also more contested, you know, what are the lessons that we can now learn from this? And I think that is something that we all have to, um, you know, think about together, but I, I am interested in what the historians have to say about that, right? Because um, I, I understand that there's also a risk of, you know, bringing too much of the present or in a way maybe instrumentalizing the past, right? So I'm, I'm you know, purposefully now saying that in those, in those voices to kind of provoke a little bit of a discussion. Or I, I, but I, I do think about that sometimes also with my own research, you know, when am I taking things too far? Um, in terms of, you know, interpreting the history. Um, although, of course, I very much agree with the values that, that, that you just <laughs> listed here, yeah. yeah. So maybe I, I will give you that question right over. I will add a second one, and you can decide how you answer uh, this, and that is the, uh, the fact that Ruth said there's, in collective memory, there's a backward-looking part, a forward-looking part. I think the forward-looking part is clear to me. The backward-looking part is something you've already mentioned um, as being important to the family, and that is the, uh, the recognition for the entrepreneurial legacy that was downplayed and that wasn't heard very much. And if you, I, mean, I know this is not a 30-second question, but if you can just very briefly explain to the people in the room born after the turn of the century, why was the department store organization so innovative and what was it that the teats, um, that the Hamann teat stores had brought that really was at the already at the base of what then after the war was uh, so successful? Can you also just tell us that because I think it helps us to understand what the backward looking um, commemoration should achieve and not not clouding. So there are two questions, and I hope uh, two, two briefly answers. The first, first one, let me come to you, Ruth, uh, to your point. I think history can teach us to be sensitive. So that's, that's my main intention, writing those books, uh, um, to be sensitive and reactive against discrimination in all forms, because we can see here so much forms of discrimination going over to, to rob open robbery and, and, and what you mentioned, Alexander. So the second, second one is when we bind it together with, uh, with our starting questions, culture of remembrance, I think it's very necessary um, uh, on the one hand um, the illegal robbery of the company must be remembered, no doubt. But for me, even more important, the German culture of remembrance must learn to see the victims not just as victims. And here I come to, to, to the second question for you. Um, we have to honor also the, the historical significance uh, of the family. Here especially the Tietz family building up, um, yeah, to put it briefly, a really new culture of consumption, the starting point of mass consumption in Germany uh, um, in the 1920s, I would tell you, 1910s to 1920s, that was really innovative to have these big department stores uh, where you can buy everything at, at, a, at a fixed price. Um, and, and where all these, um, uh, these, these colors of consumption are presented to the people um, where, uh, where they can f find these connection between how I, cons I consume uh, to make it uh, yeah, to, to, to bring my lifestyle into public, so on. And, and it changed uh, the city, uh, the, the, the inner cities of, of, uh, of, of the big, of Berlin uh, at foremost, because these big warehouses where in the center of the city, people are coming into the city. What we know today, uh, coming here at Friedrichstraße or going to KDW and, and uh, having this yeah, uh, uh, special character of a city center. So that was all part of these innovative entrepreneurs bringing the department stores 
uh, to Germany and the Tietz family was one of the very important of them. So we have their culture integrated in our culture, so let us use them again to identify ourselves with the history. Do you want the concluding that, comment and then we'll open it up? Johannes, please. The comment that the second point by my view is that we um, accept the, that you said, maybe in a, in a, in a border sense uh, to adapt the, the family teats Jason Zwillenberg to the identity of this house. So it's not longer only an uh, institution of the, of the, of the of, uh, foundation founded by the Kark uh, family. And Hattie is more, uh, the name Hattie is more than Hattie. <laughs> it's also Hermann Tietz. And uh, to open in this way, uh, to, to a broader identity also of the school, it's for the school, it's, uh, uh, it's not so difficult as for the foundation. You can't change uh, the deed of the foundation. Uh, but a school, a school, you have more room of maneuver in this kind. Uh, so uh, think about your own identity. Thank you. With this, we will open it up. Um, raise your hand if you'd like to come in with a question or a comment, and maybe we'll collect a couple of them so that we don't speak too much and we can hear from you. Yes. And just get a mic wherever it's closest, and if you can present yourself, that would be wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for all of the insights. I'm very happy to study at a school that confronts its history. Um, yeah, so basically my question was in the direction of research and how we approach this. So research as in not necessarily always being neutral, especially also when looking into the past of this country. So kind of in the direction of positionality, epistemic justice, and reflexivity. Um, whose knowledge and perspectives matter in this process of collective memory and culture of remembrance, and how can we provide space at Hurti to ensure that belonging um, of historically marginalized groups is ensured and that we don't fall into this representation trap in a way of tokenism? And genuinely, who speaks and who's heard? <laughs> um, also as a question for policy making, maybe, and whose perspectives are taken seriously in these conversations and whose don't. So that's my critical question. <laughs> Thank you. I saw a hand on this side and then I see a hand up in the front, whoever. That's very kind of you, but I have you on my list as well. Hi, um, my name is Julia. I used to work for the Hertie Foundation and it's a technical question for Johannes and Ingo. Um, I haven't read the book, so I, I'm, I'm I believe you're, you mentioned all your sources and so on, but I would be very interested to hear what archives did you use? Like, which sources were fruitful for you in your research? Uh, especially as you mentioned, for example, the face-to-face -face meetings between Kark and the Tietz family. I'd be very surprised if he kept very diligent notes. So, how did you did you reconstruct some of the the facts that you you were able to uh, to mention in the book? Thank you. We'll take all four. Go ahead, and then we give it back to. Yeah, thank you very much for this panel. Um, I'm Anna Delius. I also used to work for Hertie Foundation. I don't work there anymore, uh, but also I'm a historian, so I'm very interested to read the book. And um, thank you, Alexander, to, um, for, your, for all your activism throughout the years. Um, my question is to the two historians on the panel, um, how uh, typical of German post-war history would you say is the whole process that you now, um, yeah, now you're showing in the book. Um, maybe as uh, historians of entrepreneurship, you have also studied other companies, other contexts. I would like to know how you um, yeah, evaluate this whole history in the context of um, German Nachkriegsgeschichte, post-war history. And now the mic back to the other side again. And the back rows will get a mic as well, but we'll, you first. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Max Tyree, Hertie's member, uh, Hertie class of 2021. Um, since graduation, I've been part of the, the vibrant Berlin FinTech industry. Um, and so when I hear about the negotiations of the Teeth family and the Kog, uh, and Georg Kog, 
I can't help but hear a little bit of a different side of the story, which is um, negotiators from the Teats family side that had an incredible understanding of the time value of money, as well as uh, ability to analyze a market and understand its future capacity. And so I wanted to ask if there is, uh, if you have any comments on the skills of the Teats family during the negotiation process, if it were per was perhaps them engaging in personal conversation because they knew they couldn't stand up to the legal departments of such a large company or anything uh, of, that, of that nature. So I wanted to hear, uh, like I said, I, I can't help but see, hear their incredible foresight in those negotiations and wanted to hear if you had, saw any um, evidence of that. Let's take some answers and then open it back up. Whoever wants to go first, please grab a mic. Well, um, 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 the Teach family had good lawyers, yeah, uh, so, and they could pay them. Uh, that makes a difference uh, to uh, the fate of other uh, department store entrepreneurs. Uh, most of them were Jewish faith, and uh, most of them were persecuted. And uh, well, they had a dramatic scenes of a, I know one entrepreneur in Berlin. It's a, from a department store in Neukölln, and he was wrapped out until one maybe fifty cents, and uh, they, so he could buy a ticket to Lisbon third class. And uh, this man has been a millionaire before. Um, so this also it depends on uh, maybe the scale of the, the company of the group. And Tietz Group was very important and was very influent in in in, in the in the economy. So uh, government couldn't afford to uh, to to, to, uh, to to send this group in liquidation. Uh, another one is a the Touring question um, to the archives. Um, uh, yeah, there is no uh, tradition on. There is no Hati archive. No tradition of archives for, for files uh, from the Hati. Uh, so we needed um, to, to focus on uh, files of uh, uh, of institutions, uh, of law courts, and uh, of the uh, Tietz uh, Jason family. Yeah. We, we have uh, no ego documents from Georg Haag, nearly no ego documents, yes, uh, not after uh, 1935, 1936, no? there is not much. And um, uh, it was very helpful with, uh, with the, the, in, in the archives of the banks, Deutsche Bank, uh, especially Commerzbank in Frankfurt. Uh, which are part of this uh, Aris Ionization Consortium. Uh, and uh, uh, another source was uh, this archive in Liechtenstein. Uh, yes, and uh, they called us. I didn't know that there were some files, but they called us and uh, they had read this in the Jewish Allgemeine newspaper on this project and that uh, come to us, we, we can show you many things uh, on the Tietz family. Um, that was interesting, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the files of the Jason and Tate's family in the Leo Beck Institute, but I think that's up to Ingo because he was in New York. Yeah, so yeah, let, let me, I try uh, all the four answers uh, from the last one to the first one, so I, I, I will t uh, give a little bit more information about that. Uh, let me start with with your last command. So, so I mentioned that the family was really resilient, and self confident, and that they were really, uh, and especially uh, when we com compare it to other families. Um, and I think uh, there are many reasons on that. So we have on very important is uh, is the Jason family, is Ro Jason and uh, it's uh, his husband Kurt Jason, uh, who was teached as a attorney in Germany before 1933. So he knew the German legal system, um, and there, as I told you, um, there were conflicts. Uh, and they have these huge amount, how can we 
put into value a company with, I think, 35 branches, with the residences, with the, uh, with I don't know how much uh, uh, real estates. How can we put it into value? And in this uh, very decisive um, uh, and important points, um, the Tietz family and the Jason family uh, kept strong with their argument what they want uh, and what was their point uh, at it was a kind of an emotional point uh, at, at uh, where they think this is quite enough financial compensation uh, because, and I put it into my speech, there could not be any monetary restitution overweighting all these experiences. So, but, but really they were strong and resident uh, and resilient against all the attorneys from, from her team. Um, how typical is that? I think Johannes told us a little bit uh, on that. Let me come to the sources. So we used a lot of sources. We used the sources from the family. We used partially uh, the sources from the uh, from <clears throat> the Hertie Foundation. So we always try to put all uh, all parties into the game of sources. And uh, we also interviewed uh, a lot. Uh, for example, I I interviewed uh, Ro Jason. That was really an honor for me to to, to have the opportunities. Still living, still fit. I hope so. Um, it's your hundredth anniversary. Yeah, uh, she had hundredth uh, anniversary. I think uh, some weeks ago, and I I I. Um, I had the opportunity to interview her. I also had the opportunity to make an interview with uh, Charlotte Knobloch. Uh, she was as a small girl sitting at the negotiation table uh, in Munich because his father, Fritz Neuland, was the attorney in law for the Tietz family in 1949. And she told me, so, so that are these uh, emotional things. She told me, she sat at the table and says, to his father, hey, why are you? How is it possible that you are talking so businesslike at this table with all the burden of millions of dead Jewish people behind us? And he said, it's not about uh, the past, it's about the future, she told me. So I think this is really an in depth view into into this um, negotiation process where we can find there were emotions, a lot of emotions, uh, a lot of vulnerability and so on. But on the other side, uh, the idea to go on, you know what I mean? Okay, so, and the first question, yeah, it's always, we have to, to really critically read the sources not to fall into the standardized narratives. And we try to, to, to bring up the sources to, uh, to give, to give uh, the victims a voice. So, so that, is, uh, that is the good way to be, in a, uh, the, uh, the good thing to be an historian. You, you can look at the sources and, and maybe you can make oral history and talk to the people. And, and sure, we have problems with that. What, what is uh, this narrative and, and that narrative? But we are trying to, to, to put the things critically together in a picture. Can I just, can yes, I, just, please. I, just, I just also want to answer your question because I think it's a very important one. And I, I will say that, that in connection to the, remem to the remembrance activities moving forward and to the commemoration culture, and I, I actually hope that maybe we can do better than the German commemora commemoration culture, that, um, that there are critical voices about how it's at times exclusive. For example, the book Subcontractors of Guilt that you may know um, documents that. And so my hope is that 
we can be inclusive in the remembrance culture that we build. And I also think we have to be because we are an international community. And I think that was makes us great. That's what makes this, you know, um, a, a very rich process. But we are an international school at, in Berlin, in Germany. And so this is, I think, a very interesting tension that I think we'll have to, you know, work through as, as we're embarking on this, on this journey. Yeah. Let me um, open up one last time. We have 10 minutes left. I also want to say some concluding words of what we're planning after we've all read the book um, and how you can, by the way, go, go to read the book. But uh, let me first collect questions once more and then conclude. Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I'm Johannes Prag, also a member of the Hatiz Initiative. Um, coming from Hamburg, and when you started your presentation, I had to. Um, uh, we all saw the KDW, but also the Alster House, a very prominent location. Just one short comment I want to make. I think the innovative concept which um, the Teets family introduced is one thing, but I think also one aspect is the uh, real estate they maybe built or acquired, but I think this is uh, still top locations as we still face now the uh, this year 2024 the um, bankruptcy of the KDV group and uh, due, due to the involvement with the Benko group um, I would like to ask a question regarding the role of the banks you mentioned Commerzbank and Deutsche Bank but what were the um, in particular as you mentioned the anecdote with, uh, with the interview with Sch uh, Charlotte Knoblauch what Banks were involved. Were they um, uh, were the local banks from Munich, or Hamburg, uh, Berlin, or were they, yeah, general Deutsche Bank? That's my question. Thank you. Let me take one more. People in the back, raise your hands. You haven't been given a mic, and you can. Here's one. Thank you very much. Um, I can't help but wonder or notice, I should say that there is no representative of the foundation on the panel. And uh, when we speak about remembrance and what this book means for, um, for uh, remembering this history and going forward as well, I'm uh, wondering, um, as this touches not only on the Hertie School but on the Hertie Foundation as a whole, what um, the foundation's reaction to the study is and what they're planning, apart from, Alex, what you already mentioned. Thank you. Did you want to answer the Hamburg asset? It's a, it's a, ba it's a question. bank question. In the <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, we speak about 50 banks. Is there a, it was a consortium, or is, I think it was a dozen banks uh, around, uh, led by the Dresdner Bank and uh, Deutsche Bank and Commerzbank and uh, also Mendelssohn, for instance, uh, Jewish uh, private banks, uh, Warburg. Uh, well, that was the, the banks, uh, the created uh, banks, the banks uh, where the Hermann Tietz uh, group had uh, the, the bank contact of the group. Yeah? And then we have another 30 mortgage uh, banks. Yeah? And uh, because, um, as I already said, it was always a department stores and a question of estate, the estate business. Yeah? Uh, maybe more than the, the retail business. Uh, and uh, they had these mortgages um, of about 20, 20 or 30 millions and a uh, standstill agreement between these mortgage banks was necessary. So <laughs> you had, uh, maybe Dresdner Bank was a, uh, let's a consortium, but it was uh, all sort of Berlin uh, financial uh, scene was, was uh, engaged in this case. And let me maybe answer and also conclude, um, but let me answer the question about the Hattie Foundation. So today's event is the second event of a two-part 
book launch. The first book launch was in Frankfurt, organized by the Hattie Foundation and with the discussion with the authors and members of the, of the community in Frankfurt. Today, we wanted to give the English-speaking public an opportunity to discuss the book, and we're doing it at the Hattie School. Um, the Hattie Foundation is in the room in the person of uh, Frau Immels here, um, and the Hattie, the Hattie Foundation is also um, the ones that want you all to have a book for free if you'd like it, and this is why the books here are all um, set up so you can take one home. We wanted to make sure that this is available for students who are interested in the story. As you said, uh, this is not something you should look out and, and in a dusted library, but we want to be able to do this for every incoming year of students, so we've been graciously given, thank you to the Hattie Foundation, a lot of copies for those of you who read German. And for those of you who don't, I also wanted to mention that uh, we're keenly aware, and I'll also say this to the Tietz family and the Jason family who've asked for this, we're keenly aware that what we really need is an English translation for this book. Um, and um, Andrea Schneider can talk about this. Uh, she's currently negotiating with um, editors in English that would publish such a book. We've noted on the wish list it should be open access. Uh, that's something possibly to include in the negotiations. So we're actively um, trying to see all together how to make that possible so that for, for us what's important, everybody who's interested can find these resources and get access to it. And so what I also wanted to say in conclusion, to, uh, in addition to saying take a book with you if you want to read German, um, if you, if, or if you have a friend who can, <laughs> um, uh, we're, we're hoping to be able to talk about the translation um, sometime very soon and maybe have a second book launch with the English translation again to a, a new a set of students possibly and you if you're still interested. And what we're really also working on, and that is uh, taking up most of our time, is how to build that collective remembrance culture. That is something that uh, we're in contact with a lot of different stakeholders, and uh, I've mentioned it at different occasions, so some of you might already know, is planned for the new campus that we're hoping to move to um, in the Robert Koch Forum. And so we're now thinking, what does it mean to talk about our name in a building that is also a historical building, provide this story, but also provide elements of a very different story, and that is Robert Koch. And Robert Koch, I don't know how aware you are of the Robert Koch history, has a, um, has a, a, a medical achievements and a very, a, a very conflicted, dark colonial history where he did experiments on human subjects. And we also want to give elements of these, um, these parts of a history that will be linked to by moving into a building that will carry this name that is owned by the city of Berlin. So to a certain degree, building up something that for us is part of our identity not just with the name, but also an identity of engaging with the things that surround us is important. We're hoping to do so together, and that's why there's a lot of stakeholders involved. And we're hoping that this can be then an occasion to have a building with anchors that are full of symbols or a symbol, um, engage students that are coming in through walking tours, through discussions, possibly through lecture series, and to make it a very active part of everyday life, which is um, what a book like this can give us entrance to, but that is something that we have to make live as a community. The Hattie Foundation is doing other things. They're in discussion with the family, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, but you should correct me, on um, a statute to the company's founder, Oscar Tietz. Hermann Tietz was the capital, uh, the person, the uncle who granted the capital, but Oscar Tietz is really the businessman you saw up in the presentation, and that is something that will be in the garden of the future building of the Hattie Foundation. So there are different projects going on with, to, uh, as all of them, the idea that you need an anchor to keep something alive and to engage with it, and that's what we would like to build. Like yes, please, I'll, and take a mic so that... I can add something. We are also planning to have a, a dialogue with the next generation, to the, um, the younger people from the families and with younger people in our foundation to get in dialogue and to see how the next generation could work on it and keep alive the, the memory. Because that was a thing also from the family that they are a bit um, afraid or in sorrow that when they are not anymore there, who will keep it up? And so to give it to the next generation in their family and also in our foundation. So that's also a project that we do. Okay, thank you.
If you have questions about all of these elements, we have a wonderful reception, so you can walk up to us and ask us more. I hope you have now identified the people that can ask, answer different parts of your question. Um, all the historical questions, archival questions should go here. All the uh, student protest activism and how to make the best of your Hertie experience should go here. All the social psychology should go to Ruth, and of course, uh, Vaimes will answer questions that could go to the Hertie Foundation. Thank you very much for being part of this discussion, for being part of the activism for those of you who were, and we're looking forward to raising a glass and, and talking more about these. Thank you. Thank you.